December 2014. We're at port in Umanag Bay. Ice storm in the polar night of Greenland. The why our expedition schooner is stuck. Risking a collision which would put an end to our entire expedition in an instant. We have been braving the elements of the far north for eight months to uncover the secrets of these frozen waters. My name is Guilain, and with Emmanuel, my wife, we are passionate about this unique territory of water and ice. This is the second mission we have undertaken above the Arctic Circle, the longest as well. We are explorers seeking new worlds. Our speciality, polar diving. We have just made 150 dives where no human has ever been before with record-making dives more than 100 meters deep. We have encountered people living far from our rapidly changing world, and were even able to observe the mysterious Greenland shark. It's one of the wildest things I've ever seen. But it is now that our expedition comes into its own, during the overwintering, when the ice traps this unknown world. Our goal is to study the life of the ice flow through its entire cycle, day after day, from the freeze up to the break up, both on the surface and underwater. It is a rare scientific opportunity, achieved through extreme and unprecedented dives in water at minus temperatures. A long immersion that lets us get close to the local population to benefit from their experience and share our observations. To accomplish this extraordinary adventure, Emmanuel and I have put together a solid crew, skilled in extreme conditions. Luca and Martin are divers. Miroslav, a researcher in human physiology and glacial environments. Sylvain is the engineer on board. Veronique, a doctor, and Priscilla, a chemist, will help Heidi Sorensen, who is supervising this ice flow study from her laboratory in Copenhagen. A genuine family, with the addition of an unusual passenger, Robin, our son. A unique Christmas for my little two-year-old boy. It's time. Can we open the presents now? What is it? I don't know. Oh, Papa's going to love that. Champagne! Such extensive fireworks in one city. I've never seen that. And this is Greenland. Incredible. It's time to get back to work. Pumanak Bay is finally starting to freeze over. Back up, back up. There are some large ice blocks that are slowly coming toward you. Can I go ahead or do I hit the block? Move over to starboard a bit, because the ice sheet is on port side, and go forward port side. You're free of it. To make sure we don't get stuck, I decide to flee this fishing village and head towards our overwintering spot to start our research. We've still got the same ice conditions, but 20 meters ahead of you, it looks a bit thicker. Maybe it isn't, but you'll still get a lot of ice chunks. A single centimeter of fairly soft ice that rolls with the waves. The boat breaks through it very easily. But it starts like this, and in a few days, we'll have it all around the boat. There won't be any wind, no swells, nothing, and bang, it will thicken underneath and form a huge sheet of ice we can walk over. The Y acts as an icebreaker in this shifting sea. But the goal is actually to get frozen in by the ice flow until summer, for five months. Bon. 
Okay, it's perfect. Let's set up for the winter. There's nothing left to do. Just be patient and wait until the liquids get solid, until the sea turns into an ice flow. Every day during these rare moments of clarity, we can observe the progress of getting iced in, impatient at the idea of walking on water. There's ice everywhere. What a sight. It's really fantastic. Are you cold? Yes. Well, of course, that's normal. Soon, there'll be solid ice all around the boat and we'll be able to walk around everywhere. Look, you see the ice? We're going to be able to walk on the ocean. I think we'll stay on board for a few days and then when the ice flow comes, we'll go on the snow, OK? Meantime, we stay here on the boat. Yes, hello. Hello. Hi. Hey. How are you guys doing? Hi, dear. Nice to see you. So how are you guys? It feels like time is dragging in Copenhagen too. Heidi, a marine microbiologist, has high expectations for the observations and samples that the Y crew will conduct. She studies plankton and its implications for carbon capture. The ice flow is a rich life support system. It is crucial that we as a species better understand how it works and how it's changing. So that's really good. I don't know if I actually ever told you guys, but this is actually the first time that somebody's going to take measurements throughout whole sea ice seasons, because normally you don't have that much time. Again, because it's just logistical, really difficult to, to have people staying there. So it's going to be really interesting. As soon as we can walk, I will call you and uh, show you the first images and the first uh, samples of uh, the drilling in the ice that we can do. That would be awesome. And please, please send pictures from, from underneath the ice and so on, so we can really see what's going on. That would be awesome. We keep in touch. Right? Yeah, you too. Thank you so yeah. much, Heidi. Bye. 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 There are 12 of us on board, all trapped in the ice. Winter seems to be eternal in this land of the Aurora Borealis. And then, after waiting for three weeks, we're finally released. Here we go! I dreamed of this, but you can't really imagine yourself here. Having this kind of immense, all-white playground around us. We spent many long weeks stuck on board. This is going to be good for all of us here. Having all this space. Should we keep going? You have to ask Kayak. OK, here we go. We've been waiting for this moment for months. We are eager to start diving, to explore the hidden side of the ice flow, to go see what we'll find deep within it. But before we start, we want to introduce ourselves. There's an isolated Inuit village on the opposite side of the bay. I'm sure that from over there, we must spark a great deal of curiosity. Ikerasak is the name of this village, barely 200 residents and twice as many dogs. What a sweetheart! He wonders where we are after that long ride. There they are. It's a dog sled. Hello. Hello. Initial hesitant contact. Yeah. 
We meet Jorgen, who has just caught a seal. I don't yet know it, but Jorgen will be important to our adventure and become our friend. Kimek for dog, Puesi for seal. Emmanuel is initiated into this technique that uses a white screen for concealment so that hunters can get close to the seals. But for us, it's the opposite. Time to come out in the open. Jorgen points out the road to the school. The Ikerasak community is waiting for us. Hello. Hello. We come from France. It's great because it's the first exchange with the population of Ikerasak and we are able to tell them a bit about who we are, what we're doing, where we come from, and then, well, we obviously have a lot to learn from them. Who would like to try that in? We all want to. <laughs> they have accepted us. It's now possible for us to access the ice flow along with their fishing and hunting territory. There's no more time to waste. The very next morning, the entire crew is ready for a first reconnaissance dive. We have to sharpen up our reflexes, both above and below water. Our lives depend on it. So we're going to see a lot of dives, a lot of divers. The idea is just that we all go over everything concerning preparations for the under-ice dive, which can be extremely dangerous. If you get lost, for example, if the hole is here and you're turned away from it or in the dark underwater, you can be three metres from the hole without seeing it. You can get disoriented very quickly because there are no visual references under the ice and that's why people die diving under ice. This yellow rope is our lifeline, which makes sure we find the way out. It links the divers to the assistance on the surface, on the ice flow. As soon as visibility drops and whenever we're worried that poor visibility may occur, it's best to tie up immediately. The polar night only leaves us with a few brief moments of light. So, as a symbol of this overwintering, we launch our dive programme at night. It's minus 25 degrees. I haven't even put a fin in the water and I'm already frozen. The ice has made its way into everything, into the regulators, the purges, even the masks. The thermos bottles with hot water have become our best tools for de-icing the equipment. In fact, everything takes more time in the cold. Not only getting ready, storing gear and everything around it. It's not just the dive. Everything takes time in the cold. And generally speaking, when you plan to do something, it takes nearly ten times longer than it would in temperate climates. Given the level of salinity, the water temperature can be lower than zero degrees, even minus 1.8. And as opposed to open water dives, I won't have any other emergency exit than this hole. This lifeline is the only link that will keep me alive. It is the passion for discovery that gives us the energy we need. I have rarely made such extreme dives. <laughs> Let's go. It's time to step into the unknown. There's something unreal about this first nocturnal contact with the underwater Arctic world. The underwater world seems asleep during the polar night. 
the brand new ice flow has blocked icebergs as they drift slowly. For us, they are an ideal playground for conducting our mission and recording all the forms of life that they contain. During our first dive, this shrimp emerges from its ice cave to meet us. The water is at its clearest during these months of winter. Meanwhile, I float as weightless as an astronaut, discovering this new blue and white planet. It is intense, but after a one hour dive in this glacial water, I can no longer feel my fingers the first sign of hypothermia. It's time to resurface. The temperature of our hands and feet is sometimes close to zero degrees. That was great. Up you come. Okay, we've got you. Beautiful. I need the warmer. It's over there. Bye. I'm freezing. I want to get back to the boat. Want some help with that? My hands hurt. They're starting to tingle. It's a bit painful. Can't even feel it in the glove. But it's still alive. I'm going to dash to the boat to warm up. I'm done in. OK, see you later. Here's Sivan. The boat's moving. The ice is breaking up. There's no rest on the Y. There's a massive storm which reminds us of the danger of this extreme territory. The strong winds have broken up the ice, which is still fragile, dangerously destabilizing our boat, our only refuge here in the middle of nowhere. A large hole has appeared to starboard and it has crushed the ice flow to port. We picked up the equipment lying around. So uh, if it gets worse, we'll have less work. It's a bit cold this morning. Let's take a look. Yeah, we made it. Since I got here, basically in December, there's been ice. But in the last few days, it turned into an ice palace. <laughs> Minus three, something like that. The metal conducts cold more than other materials, so the ice gathers there. And all these small spots, those must be screws. So I pulled out the big red sleeping bag that's usually for outside, made for surviving the North Pole, and uh, it'll help me survive inside. The ice usually melts a bit when I sleep. My breath melts a little bit above me, and in the morning, there's less ice than when I went to bed. But today, it's so cold this morning that there's more ice than yesterday. The water tap is frozen, and if we don't get it working quickly, the drains will freeze for sure. So we have to hurry. It's complicated enough already to use the toilets. You have to get a bucket to pee in and for water to cook. I didn't even know it was possible before seeing that it was frozen. And then here inside, the glasses are trapped in the ice. It's a shame because we can't use them anymore. It's going to be slightly more complicated. 
But there are waffles. But there are waffles. Before starting our plans for dives, writing, reading, it's crazy the time we spend just so that we can function every day. We wanted to overwinter. We're overwintering. This is what it's like. We created a daily observation schedule for ourselves, which is as comprehensive as possible, even if Robin is not always happy to see me disappear under the ice. We're going to go sledding. Well, we have to ask Papa. Do you want to go sledding on the iceberg? We do it once, OK? You could start from right here. No, Guillain, don't do that. Don't worry, it's not dangerous. We did it! Playtime is over. We have to dive again and again, despite the cold that we will never get used to. Getting ready takes two hours, an eternity. The equipment also takes a beating. The regulator doesn't work. I don't know why. Oh, uh, yeah, you got some ice there. There's no air. Is it working? Today, it's a dive under an iceberg, some 15 meters down a big iceberg, which could easily be seven meters high and go down at least 40 to 60. Look at Papa, he's going underwater. Come look. Can I have hot water in my mask? Okay. Here, you'll have to put it back on. Okay. Put it on fast before it freezes. Let's get this on tight. Great. Okay. Thanks. Everything is so complicated so that when we dive, we photograph and film everything. I feel personally responsible for documenting this environment that is so unknown to provide Heidi with the observation she needs for her study of the ice flow. I am her eyes, searching for any trace of polar life. Eyes that are awestruck every single time by the underwater landscape, a place no one has been to before. I never get tired of these enormous icebergs. This one must weigh about 200,000 tons. Time has carved multiple galleries in this giant. They can crack and break off at any time. But winter is the best time to get a closer look. Our senses alert, we decide to explore further, deep inside the monster. It's a kind of underwater speleology with an impenetrable ice ceiling over our heads. It would be easy to get lost in this labyrinth. I hold the rope tighter than ever. This lifeline is our only guide to finding the way back and to the hole that leads to open air.
life gradually returns in these glacial waters. As we swim up to the surface, we come across a school of Arctic cod, the northernmost fish, which survives because it is able to produce a natural antifreeze. Here, under the ice, as on the surface, life is only possible for those who manage to adapt. Did you hear it crack up here or not? Are you kidding? We were right under the iceberg. Ooh. Made a massive noise. <laughs> Can I take something? Yeah. And my regulator stopped working. I spot Jorgen when we come out. For several days, he has come out to visit us on our dive sites. Hello. Uh, man. Up, up. man. Up. You good today? I am gonna up. We, we, later today. You? Oui. No. I stay here. Yes. No more. Jorgen seems curious to know what we see under the ice. A world that he fears, that remains mysterious to him. This sir. This sir. This This No more. Uh -huh. Not a lot. Here, 10. Mm -hmm. Maybe 12. Um, you fishing here later? Yeah. Uh -huh. Here, Budo. Yeah. He said it was a good hole for cod. I agree with him because we catch a few big ones every day. Yeah. And he thinks that it's a very, very good spot for fishing. So he's happy that we've opened up such a large hole. Mm. Un big poutou. Big poutou for your gun. Poutou anguichard. That means a very large hole. Yeah! Ah! Yeah, but je vais filmer, je vais filmer tout Ah, bah là, il est très grand. Jorgen wants to thank us and insists on taking me back with his dogs. And the rare privilege of even letting me drive his sled. I'm in a great hunter mode. <laughs> it's pretty cool, but you have to know how to use it. That's the problem. I cracked it once and the dogs took off in the wrong direction. You learn, you can't know everything. <laughs> I will never forget crossing this ice flow after one of my most memorable dives. And to end it with this gift from Jorgen. 
That day, Jorgen became my friend. It's been too long. When was the last time we saw it? It was uh, early November? That's two and a half months. We hadn't seen it at all. Go ahead, soak it up as much as you can. <laughs> Sunlight on our faces. Vitamin D, finally. We are emerging from the polar night. It boosts the energy of the entire crew. The scientific program has become more intense. Now that the sun is back, life has returned to the ice flow on the surface and underwater. Microorganisms are growing, capturing carbon from the atmosphere, but how much? That's what Priscilla and Veronique are trying to find out for Heidi Sorensen. You see, we need this saw, a ruler. I take ice cores. But first, we're going to take temperature measurements. We're going to spend a lot of time filtering and conducting manipulations to see how this life evolves, how it changes throughout the entire season. What we're studying are the living elements within the ice or under the ice, particularly the algae that will consume carbon dioxide. Alongside these samples taken from the surface, the underwater exploration continues every day to follow changes in the ice flow. We select our diving spots according to the condition of the ice. Underwater, the relief of the ice flow is an amplified mirror of what we see on the surface. We gather as much information as we can during the hour we spend underwater with each dive. I am fascinated by these underwater ice stalactites called brinicles. They form when a flow of extremely cold, highly saline water flows downward. When it hits less saline water, it starts to freeze. We capture and record all of this little-known ecosystem. The iridescent zooplankton is hypnotic. Despite the cold, I relish the privilege of living my dream of exploration. It's like my very own conquest of the poles. This scorpion fish watching over its young is also an exceptional scene of life at this latitude. An entire unsuspected world has managed to create this harmony in glacial waters at minus one degree. But with the return of the sun, what surprises us is the sudden development of the phytoplankton and this algae attached to the ice. This proliferation will certainly be fascinating for Heidi. Okay. Hi. I see you now. <laughs> when we were diving yeah. Yeah. below sea yeah. ice, we were really seeing this kind of algae forest 
everywhere. Really? Uh, exactly. Oh, that's interesting. We can uh, we, we can send you we some pictures. Some uh, it started the yeah? beginning of uh, March. For yeah. two three weeks, it was extremely intense. Really, there is life, and it's it's not just surviving; it's thriving. Like yeah. it's it's adapted yeah. to these environments, and it's amazing. And we can also use the DNA samples to actually identify which species we have in here and see if they're changing. Uh, over the over the year. It was very good to see you and to have an exchange about that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. Nice talking to you guys. <laughs> bye bye, idea. Good luck. Bye. Thanks. Good luck. Bye. The more weeks we spend here, the more we fit into everyday life and are part of the small Inuit community of Ikerasak. Come on, honey. Take a look at this. I'm walking along the ice flow and pulling up halibut. The Inuit's knowledge of the polar environment is valuable for our research. The climate change that we talk about so much in the West, they feel it on an everyday level. Though, without worrying about it overly much, they adapt. In short, they hunt less, fish more, and have modified their techniques. Just 20 years ago, the ice flow lasted three months longer. There are fewer and fewer hunters and more and more fishermen. The price of seal skin is far too low. If you go hunting and come back with lots of seals, you're not going to make much money. Some people say it's because of the ice, because it freezes too late in the year and winters are too short. I learned how to drive a dog sled when I was little. I often went fishing with my father. Today it's similar, except that the amount of snow is different. It's strange this year because there's not a lot of snow. It's happened before, but never for such a long period. So the ice is slippery, and the dogs are always thirsty. When the ice is like this, I don't like to go too far out onto the ice flow. When we take off, it's a good idea to be on your toes. You never know if it's the musher's fault or the dogs. we immediately realize that something is wrong. One of the dogs has tangled his feet in the ropes of the sled. Now that the team is running, it's virtually impossible to stop. Even at full speed, we have to try to free the dog, otherwise he could be badly hurt. The first attempt doesn't work. We have to try something else. Last ditch solution. Steer the dogs towards the hill so that they stop their mad dash. more shaken up than injured. When there are so many ropes linking the sled and the dogs, it's safer to have them run side by side rather than in line. The weight is distributed better, and if the ice flow breaks, they won't all fall in the ice cold water. After this incident, we continue on towards Ikerasak. Oh, 
Our dives intrigue and fascinate. We decide to organise an unusual outing for the entire village, an initiation to diving under the ice. A unique opportunity for the bravest among them to see the hidden side of the territory for the first time. Super. <laughs> Let's go, she has no hat. Yeah. I got a little panic and it was difficult to breathe, but it was fun. I think it was beautiful down there because Greenland, because we never see the bottom of the water. I want to try again longer next time. Her passion for exploring may have been born today. We have been here nearly five months. Our overwintering will soon be finished. But it has helped us appreciate the value of time. Time to see and to understand. Time to get to know and enjoy one another. This is the time explorers used to take as they discovered new worlds. A way of life in itself that I hope to perpetuate. Before the ice breaks up and melts, we still have one last goal. Last summer, we made the first polar dives at depths greater than 100 meters. Now, we want to do it again, but this time under the ice flow. And these thermopiles are going to measure uh, the temperature inside your body, which might be influenced by uh, diving in this extreme cold water. It's yeah. already activated. So now we can take it. You can take it, yes. For these deep dives, we have become amphibious guinea pigs for a physiological study, and we are willing participants. So, so I, I'm getting all of you at the same time. One, two, three, four, okay. actually, yeah. So Perfect. we have it. Okay. You already started to be on diet, so where you decrease the amount of all the fibers in your food to be able to keep the pills as long as possible in, inside your body. You can't eat any fruit. No. <laughs> No fruit and syrup, no alcohol, no cheese. Oh, that's going to be fun. 
For 10 days, we are going to repeat the tests at a depth of 50 meters, taking with us these bottles filled with helium, nitrogen, and oxygen. We'll give the hoses a shot. With each dive, we improve our safety protocols and the mixes that we breathe, depending on the depth. We also perform cognitive tests. These data from such extreme dives are very important for us to understand where are the limits, because I am not sure whether there are any other so-called conditions where you can dive on Earth. So therefore, when we know where is the, the upper limit, then we can also know what can happen if you are a little bit below this limit. The main risk for divers is the compression sickness. All the tests are positive. All signals are go. With Martin, my best friend in the abyss of the ocean, we are going to start this climb in reverse, which should take us to depths greater than 100 meters under the ice flow. At the bottom and during the climb, we're not going to go far. I'm going to be doing macro. What we're doing is relatively risky, no doubt about it. They are deep dives in cold water. So there is always some risk of a problem happening. These are fairly technical, fairly difficult dives. In the minutes before we go in, we are extremely concentrated and feeling the pressure. And then there's a moment, Martin is ready, so am I, the surface crew too, and then Martin and I look at each other and decide to go. Like soldiers of discovery, we are on the front lines, prepared, trained to breach this frontier of the unknown. We follow the relief and the slope to go down. 40, 50, 70 meters. At 90 meters, our dive computers start warning us of overly high oxygen levels. It would be dangerous to continue. It's time to resurface. We pushed it a bit too far there because we stayed on our dylon, which was okay up to 70, 80 meters. But at 90 meters, there's too much oxygen, which isn't good. We couldn't decrease it. You get too much oxygen and you'll end up sizzling your brain, or what's left of it. We readjust our mixtures and the following day we head out again for the depths. We are constantly pushing our limits a bit farther and we manage to cross the 100 meter limit opening the way to an exploration of this world that remains polar, summer and winter. But now, the polar spring has begun. The thermometer reads five degrees. The ice flow is shifting. It's the breakup. The Y is gradually getting free of the ice. The breakup of the ice kind of means the end of the expedition. So this is a special moment. And then for me, it's something I've never seen at all. It's truly really magnificent. Look, now we're moving. Ah, but here come Jorgen and Jona. <laughs> Yeah. 
Yeah. That's it. We've weighed anchor. We are leaving lots of people we love. We're leaving a big part of ourselves here. The human warmth of a glacial adventure. The achievement of an underwater conquest previously inaccessible. Our pride in having broken ground for new knowledge. It's hard to fully assess it. Bye. But after 18 months spent above the Arctic Circle, a single word sums up our experience under the pole, and I am thrilled that it still has meaning. Exploration. Exploration.